This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Lefty was the name of the world's first checker-playing robot, which was located at the Omniplex Science Museum in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The robot arm would play games of checkers against museum visitors, picking up and moving pieces on a physical checkerboard. Lefty's game logic ran on an Atari 800 computer, which controlled the robot through the joystick port. Lefty was programmed by Scott Savage, the subject of today's interview. Before the interview, Scott digitized his Atari cassette tape with the code for Lefty. The tape had some problems, but community member Atari Grub successfully recovered the data. Scott also provided scans of several newspaper and magazine articles about Lefty. Both the Lefty program and those articles are now available at Internet Archive. Also, be sure to watch the only known video of Lefty in action. Scott and Lefty appeared on the TV show Danny's Day, which aired on KOCO TV in spring of 1984. This interview took place on April 14th, 2022. Well, I grew up in uh, Oklahoma in a northern suburb of Oklahoma City called Edmond. And Edmond had a pretty good high school. We uh, were huge. It was a really big high school. And of course, that just means you're walking through a sea of faces that you don't know. Um, as far as how I got started in computers, I would say that uh, my father, who had been in the computer business for a long time, um, he was the quality assurance manager for the MPI five and a quarter drives, which is kind of interesting because I see those occasionally online, somebody doing a project with them. Um, but he always encouraged this, you know, computer accessibility stuff. And even before we had things like Ataris and Commodores and Apples and stuff like that, he would bring home these uh, teleterminals where you like take the phone and you like stick it in the, the two cups. Um, and we would be talking to the million dollar mainframe out at Honeywell. And so I had an opportunity to program some stuff with that. And then by the time I hit high school, a friend, and, a friend that I had and I went to the local college and um, we to say, how do, you, how do you delicately put this? We, we borrowed a password. <laughs> And we're mm -hmm. using this uh, college account for years while we were in, you know, junior high and high school and stuff like that. We would go to the library and pick out these books on how to program. And of course, at that time, you had things like COBOL and BASIC and, you know, mainframe type languages and stuff. So, um, yeah, just, just kind of got an early start on the programming at an early age. Uh, lots of opportunities that most people did not have. And so kind of like, you know, kids today, they'll like start programming and stuff all on their own. But back when I was doing it, nobody had access to it. And I did. So that got me started. And I started doing these science fair projects using computers and robotics. And I built this robot arm for my science fair project senior year. And it had what I would call artificial intelligence, but it was completely fake. Uh, what I did instead was I would like take some keywords out of a sentence and throw everything else away. And so there was essentially in this thing, there was three blocks. There was a yellow one, a red one, and a blue one. And you could tell the arm, put the red block on top of the blue block and the robot arm would reach down there and it would move that accordingly. Um, but there's a ton of cheats in it because um, the robot arm, it couldn't go back and forth. It could only go in and out. So with three blocks, there is technically, there's only nine possible positions of blocks. And so mm -hmm. the arm knew where each of those were. And then as far as positioning, you could only say on, over, under, behind, before, stuff like that. And um, so I would take the color, the position, and throw everything else away. And I would have people type in these hugely complicated sentences. Put the yellow cubic style thingamajobber on top of the blue, and yet it would still do it. And everybody was baffled. 
how this thing worked. And I told nobody what the secret sauce was, which was <laughs> it threw everything away except for the color of the position, right? So was this and, uh, was this uh, running on an Atari computer? It was on an Atari. Okay. And how how um, how how big the arm here? Are we talking like a little robot arm like from Radio Shack? Or are we talking a big what what scale are we talking for? Where did you get this arm? Uh, we're, we're talking about the scale of this guy here. I mean, it wasn't small. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I built it out of, you know, bicycle parts and um, can openers and whatever I could get my hands on at the local thrift store where I could pay a nickel and get some machinery. Um, and it was it was horribly kludged together. Um, it was a Frankenstein of all accounts. Um, it had a bicycle brake caliper as the gripper. And a um, couple of sensors that I threw together. You know that um, the foam that you put an IC into, the static foam? Sure, yeah. Turns out that if you put a plate of metal on both sides of that, you have a pressure sensor because as you squish it, the resistance gets less. And so I had the caliper lined with that stuff. And so when it actually got the block, it knew it had it and it would stop the motor. And so all this stuff was interfaced to the Atari. And I went through the front port, which is a peripheral interface adapter for the joysticks, but it can both read and write data. Um, and you effectively had uh, eight bits per side plus the triggers. So I had everything I needed to do addressing and data and signals coming out of the uh, ports. I didn't have to do any fancy. Um, you know, get into the circuit boards of the Atari. I just hooked everything up through the uh, joystick ports. How'd you do in the science uh, fair? That that project got second place at state. Uh, so I, I went from the the school to the regional. Uh, regional, I made first place, and to the state where I competed against everybody, and um, only got second place. And I was told that it would have gone national but they only like sent 50 people from the state to national and I was 51. So I was actually on the, like the backup party. If one of these canceled, I would go to nationals. And I was like really crossing my fingers going to national, but I never did, never got to national. <laughs> so I'm working at Radio Shack and a guy from the Omniplex comes walking in and buys a ton of parts. And I get into a conversation about, wow, um, what are you guys doing with this stuff? And he starts describing this exhibit. And I told him about my science fair project. And he said, um, we have some funding to do a robotics exhibit, but we're kind of like blank on what to do. And so he invited me to bring my project into the Omniplex and demonstrate it for him. And I hauled my Atari and the arm and everything out to the Omniplex and set it up and showed him. And I left that day with a job to build the robotics exhibit for the Omniplex. And originally it was just going to kind of be a more professional looking version of my science fair project with that artificial intelligence in it. Uh, but we were sitting around the lunch table one day and somebody started like talking about other things it could possibly do. Somebody throws out checkers. And I think about the logistics of how checkers works. There's, there's limited moves, limited logic. Pieces are all the same shape. And I'm like, yeah, actually it would be pretty easy to do checkers. And so they're like, well, then let's do checkers, right? Everybody knows how checkers works. And um, so we, we set forth to do this. And they, they had a guy working at the Omniplex at that time that was building these beautiful cabinets. And um, if you can show up that picture I just sent you of Lefty, that guy built that cabinet. It's a, it was it's all a beautiful, stainless. yeah. Stainless steel, it had poles, it had lights on the top. Um, it's really nice. Um, and then of course the, the robot arm was embedded into the floor of it and the Atari was on a shelf down in the bottom, um, which originally would overheat a lot. And so we had to then retrofit vents on the thing to keep the heat moving through. Um, 
guess we worked on it for about six months. I did all the electronics and all the programming. They built the case, the checker pieces, the boards. Um, and we rolled it out. Now, I remember rolling it out Thanksgiving Day of 83. But the newspaper article says it was rolled out the following Monday, which doesn't make any sense to me because we would have hit the... Um, you know, try to get the crowds that were going to come in for Thanksgiving weekend. Sure. And we, we did have a record turnout at the museum that day. It's just this mob of people standing around the robot wanting to see it. And um, the first person to play this robot was this like nine-year-old kid. And he sits down and he hasn't a clue. He's never played checkers. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> and the program will like, make the first move and then it will uh, wait for a minute and if, if you don't do anything in a minute it comes back and says hey if you don't do anything in another 30 seconds i'm going to quit so it quits and it moves its piece back to the original spot and the next guy to play it literally picks the kid up out of the seat and moves him and jumps down and starts playing this checkers game um so we wound up uh taking it to a local tv show um called danny's day and they did a little segment on it uh what else you want to know well um sure let's talk about the the danny's day segment um a couple of interesting things about it i thank you for putting that up on youtube that's um that's fun um it robot didn't work great you said because of the the, the studio lights were messing with the sensors? So the way that the, the robot works is there's stepper motors that are moving the machinery, right? There's no sensors at all to tell the robot where it is, if it moved, anything like that. Um, so what this would do is it would make the move and then it would come back to a center spot. And if you watch the video, you'll notice that every time it makes a move, it comes back to the same position and then does this little dance. It kind of goes dit, 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 dat, 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 like moving around. And what it's doing is back at the big gears, there's a reflector that I put on there and a uh, optical sensor. And it's looking for that reflector to move back and forth, right? Well, what was happening with all of those lights, the studio lights, the place was so bright, is those optical reflectors were seeing the lights instead of their own reflection. And so instead of like going back and forth like this to try to find where that position was, it would move one spot and say, oh, there it is. And so every single move it made, it would get like, a, like an eighth of an inch off. And it just kept growing in error. So it only make a couple of moves before it didn't know where it was. And so by the time it got to the last moves, it was just hitting the top of the uh, the checkers instead of going around the checker. And so it, and it, of course, I, I found this out during rehearsal. So I knew it was going to happen. And uh, so I, I mentioned that to Danny Williams and, I don't know how to politely say it. He was a jerk. <laughs> he seemed like that's a it's a weird segment to watch. He seems like he is not invested in that show in any way at all. He's interrupting people. Um, the the poor co-host woman is just like trying to keep the train on the tracks. Uh, what tell me about what his problem was? So Danny Williams was the Oklahoma City version of Wolfman Jack. He had a radio show on AM back when and. You know, he did the fun segment and stuff like this. And as he got older, he got himself this local Oklahoma City, what's going on about Oklahoma show. And people would bring different things on there. And you can see the other segments they mentioned on that clip. Um, his show had been canceled uh, for about a month. And this was the third to the last episode of Danny's Day. And from what people had told me is his attitude became more and more belligerent as he got down to the last segment. Okay. And of course, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm on TV. This is cool, you know? Um, and I don't know how to deal with this guy's comments because it's a live show. 
And um, I, I'm kind of stuck for the proper response to have. And in my head, I'm like working all this out. You know, it's like, you know, do I tell them off? Do I shut up? Do I just go on or, or whatever? And I'm, I'm at a loss for how to deal with this. Um, and over the whole thing is the fact that it's live. And so if I like, you know, cuss at them, that's going to go out live. <laughs> so I've got that in my head as well. Yeah. Well, after the program, you know, I have all these people telling me, hey, I show, saw you on Danny's Day with your robot. And I'm thinking that's that's cool, right? But all they could talk about was what a jerk Danny Williams was. I got completely upstaged by his um, losing his show. <laughs> So you made this program, um, you saved the tape, and, and over the last couple of days, we managed to get the program saved. It looks like you did it mostly in Atari Basic with some machine language for the, for the robot control. Can you, yes. Can you tell me about that? So the, the logic for the checkers was pretty easy. There's an array. It just kind of like goes through the checkers, figuring out which is the best checker to move. Um, and the way it works is just every single spot where a checker can be, which is one element in the array, uh, it looks at the checker and it says, what moves can I make? And if I make, um, if I can move one spot, give it one point. If I can move one spot and it's on an edge, give it five points. If I can jump a checker, give it 10 points. If I can jump two checkers, give it 20 and so on and so forth there's a point system and it only kept track of which place has the best points and then once it figured out okay that spot has the best points then it would come back and do it all over again for that one spot to figure out which way do i move because i really didn't have the memory to save off all the possible moves so it had to like figure this all out again once it figured out what the moves were going to be, it would take that and hand those numbers. Um, we want to move to this location, to this location. It would hand it off to the assembly language program. And the assembly language program simply moved the stepper motors. And we had to use assembly because nothing else was fast enough. Uh, Atari Basic will not drive stepper motors at any reasonable speed whatsoever. But if you know anything about the 6502, it does not have a divide or a multiply command. So I'm trying to do like ratios of moves so that, you know, the, the arm going across, I want this motor and this motor to arrive at the same place, sorry, at the same time. And that means if this one has five steps and this one has 50 steps, then this has to go 10 times faster than this one. And so I had to like come up with a, uh, division routine in assembly language for that. And I couldn't find any books on the subject. I couldn't find anything. And of course, we didn't have the internet back then. You had to find books. And uh, so I kind of like worked that out on my own. How do you do division in binary assembly? And as it turns out, you do it exactly the same way as if it was decimal. You just do bit shifting and your subtraction and see if it. Uh, holds that number or not. So if you look at the very bottom of the program, you'll see data with a bunch of code in it. And that's the assembly language program, which the source code for it's long been lost. And I don't think I have a cassette with that on there. Uh, but in the middle of the program, there's a spot that says move to the motor here. And you'll see that it's just a, a USR command with the parameters, with the variables. And so it's all it's saying is move, move the arm to this position, move the arm to that position. And of course it's, uh, it's blind. It's just waiting for the assembly language program to come back and say done. So did you do this job as a, were you an employee of the museum or was this like a contract gig or how did it, how did it play out for there, for, from there? So originally, originally when I got there, they actually had an exhibit staff. And so they had two people working at the time. I was hired as a third person. And our job was just to build exhibits. And so I get this job and I, it's like, you know, a dream job for me. I'm just straight out of high school 
you know, building scientific apparatus to demonstrate how this stuff works to the population. And um, I went on from that to do a, another exhibit called Dimes Box, or more technically, I added a voice synthesizer to an existing exhibit called Dimes Box. And what they had was a, a it's like a five foot cube of plexiglass, like two inch thick plexiglass. And at the top, they had a like a, a counter and a little Coke change sorter. And so that all the dimes would fall in the box and all the loose change would be returned to the person. And for every dime that went in, this little counter would go click one more, click one more. And um, they were going to say when they got a million dimes, this is what a million looks like. And then they're going to spend $100,000 on new exhibits. Um, it was not collecting dimes very fast. It had been up there for years and it had this small little pile of dimes in the bottom of it, right? So they decided, well, hey, what if we put a voice synthesizer on it? So I wrote a program uh, that used an SPO 256 from Radio Shack. Um, and I worked out the logistics of, you know, how do you speak this? Um, and we ran that off of a 6502 as well. And so now you put in a dime and it says, you know, very robotically sounding, thank you for dime number 452,000. And what would happen was, is that it wasn't so much that that was compelling to get people to put a dime in it, but they would put the dime in there and there's all this noise going on in this museum, right? And this robot would go, bah, 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 and they would say, what did it say? And they start digging out dimes, trying to figure out what the <laughs> thing is. <laughs> and so that pile of dimes just started getting exponentially bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, there, there were some other projects. I did a sonar project so that when you walked up to something, it would like turn on. And I used a Polaroid camera sonar. Um, if anybody knows the name Steve Ciarcia, he did a an article on how to like rip one of those sonars out of a camera and use it. I used his design to to construct that project. And then um, and then one day they announced we're not going to do employees for exhibits anymore. We're going to move to contractors. So everybody, you're on your own. And I, I wasn't in a place, I didn't have my own shop. I didn't have what it would take to like build an exhibit and come to them and say, pretty please, will you buy this from me? So I moved on, did, uh, did something else. And uh, I, will, I will say this about Dimes Box. Um, about a year after I left, uh, I was talking to one of the guys out there and they said they had a break in and somebody came in there and cut a big hole in the side of dimes box and scooped out thousands of dimes. <laughs> and I can't imagine how many vending machines that person had to eat in <laughs> over the years <laughs> with all these dimes. I mean, how do you get rid of dimes, right? Right. So, this, this is way before coin star machines. <laughs> <laughs> right. Turn those dimes into real money. The so the the robot and the Atari uh, went up uh, in around Thanksgiving, nineteen eighty three, right? Right. How right. how long did they stay as an exhibit in the museum? The way I understand it is that the original exhibit funding was fifty thousand dollars, and so you know how are the accountants allocated that out? Uh, my salary for the time I was working on it, the maintenance. Uh, and for a few years after I left, they would call me up occasionally saying, hey, we need the cables on the robot restrung or uh, we need the program reloaded, which by the way is another point. Um, there was a cassette deck there with the Atari. And if the power ever went off, you know, a cassette doesn't automatically load itself. So they would call me and say, you know, the, the robot needs its brains again. And I would have to come in there and like rewind the cassette and do all the stuff on the Atari to get that cassette loaded. And uh, it, it brought me into the museum often enough that, you know, kind of had an ear on what's going and stuff like that. And then just one day the, 
the conversation stopped. And apparently they had run out of funding for Lefty. And until somebody else, you know, put some money into the account, Lefty had now been relegated to the back room of the other exhibits that don't have funding to do any maintenance on. And so that actually leads to this next point. Um, we did not know that this was the world's first checker playing robot. Um, they just had money to build a robotics exhibit. I was just completely jazzed to have a job doing this. And we did our thing and moved on. So maybe about six or seven years back, I was just kind of poking around the internet to see what existed out there. And I couldn't find any other checker playing robots that were even close to as old as this one was. So I called up the Omniplex and I said, hey, I think this might be the world's first checker playing robot. And so they did some independent research and they got back with me and said, we think it is too. And then we contacted Guinness Book World Records and they took a long time, finally got back and said, you know, in, unless somebody like jumps up and says otherwise, we're going to say it's the world's first checker playing robot. And so I go back to the museum and I says, we should pull it out of the back room, find somebody who will fund it again and we can put it back out. But instead of it just being a checker playing robot, it's going to be a world's first. So now a big deal. And I was told they can't. And I'm like, well, why not? And they said that um, after a certain amount of time that exhibits stay in the back room, they're hauled off to a landfill. And so Lefty the Robot, the world's first checker playing robot, is in a landfill in Oklahoma somewhere. And um, what do you do about that? That's sad. Gone. Yeah. It is sad. Hmm. But that's, that's what this guy is for. Um, now, okay, now, so some people are uh, listening just audio only. So that's a, a small robot on your, on your shelf. It looks like it's a smaller it's version. Small. It's not small? How? All right. It's not, it's not small. Um, let me walk over there and give you an idea. All right. That's my hand. Oh, okay. No, that's not small. All right. So that's a, a, good, a medium-sized uh, robot arm. Um, yeah. If, did, you, um, did you build that or is that a, where did that come from? No, that, that is a, called a rhino robot. It's, um, it's actually kind of a Frankenstein of a number of different models. Um, I, this is one that, let's see, where's my hand? This one right here is in its original form. And that's a, that's a Mark II, it's a Mark III. Uh, this one has pieces of a Mark III, a Mark II, and a Mark I in it. And I picked the different pieces because I wanted to look the most mechanical I could possibly make it and also have no plastic pieces. So this is 100% metal, except for the little fingers there, which are there to grip the checker. And um, so I built a, a controller for this and I'm gonna put it out running the original checker playing robot code, but it's a different robot. It uses chain drive instead of cable drive. It should be way more robust in working 24 seven because I'm gonna put it online and have everybody in the world be able to play this thing. Awesome. Um, where did your, the original robot arm come from? That was a, for, for the museum, I mean, that was uh, an off the shelf industrial product? Yeah, it was, um, and I'll, I'll get you some information for the segment on it, but it was from uh, Collins Robotics out of England. And the exhibits director at the time, he bought it and didn't tell anybody. And so we're kind of like scratching our head, trying to figure out, you know, how to put together this check for playing robot. And one day this robotic arm, which you'll see in the pictures and videos and stuff, it just kind of shows up uh, on the doorstep one day. And he's like, there is your robot arm. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, great, you know. And it turned out to be probably the cheapest robot arm he could get his hands on. <laughs> 
I, I wish he would have uh, consulted with me and gotten a better, more robust arm. But, you know, now we had that and we did what we did with it. Tell me about your, your program, uh, the actual checkers playing part. Was it, uh, did it beat everybody? Was it too easy? So the original version was very simple. It just says, do the point score, figure out where you can move. If you can jump somebody, do that instead. And I put it out there and I would watch people play this thing to see how well it did. And people were just killing it. They, they were able to beat it easy. And so I would say like, okay, there's, there's really no strategy in this program at all. And so I would say like, okay, well, people are doing this and getting the best of it and getting this. And I would run back and I would change the program codes so that it wouldn't make those mistakes anymore. And I would put that out. And then over time, the situation reversed. Now people would start playing it and it was just completely slaughtering them. Uh, people couldn't get a, a checker. It was taking all their checkers away from them. And they would like play like the first part of a game and get up and leave. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not what we want as a museum experience. We want to have some semblance of being able to actually win. So um, I went and purposefully took out some of the checks that it was doing, uh, some of the easy checks, but not some of the hard checks. And what it gave was this, this situation where it seemed to play really well, but then would make stupid mistakes occasionally. And so people would like get a piece for every piece it took kind of a, a situation. I somewhere found a balance in that. And now people would actually play to win. They would sit there and go through the whole game. And we had this one employee that knowing what it checked for and knowing what it was not going to look at, he would play the game with that strategy and uh, be able to beat it every time. And he got pretty good at it where um, he would hardly lose a piece to it. But of course, I don't think any museum goer was going to like have the time to work out the logistics on that. Sure. Why was it called Lefty? Um, the general idea was that it had one arm. And so somebody at the lunch table uh, one day, they, they pointed out that the exhibit needed a name. You know, like Dimes Box has a name. Um, all their exhibits have these names to them, you know. And so we're kind of trying to come up with a name. And somebody says, well, it all, only has one arm. Why don't we call it Lefty? And that's all it took. Its name was now Lefty. Makes sense. Did you do any other projects with your Atari computer at uh, personal, not, not even necessarily with the museum, just uh, you know, as, a, as a kid playing around um, with it? Everything. Um, I, I tried to enter into the video game arena because you, know, you hear these stories about the, the guy who programmed 20, minor 2049 er he was Bill like Hogue, 16, yeah. yeah, he was like 16 years old and bought a helicopter. <laughs> and I'm like, that's what I need to do. <laughs> so I'm like coming up with what, you know, what what kind of video game. And I I had drawn out this whole scenario and got the like down to the pixels and everything. I was gonna make a Donkey Kong clone and um, had worked quite a bit on it, never pushed it through to the finish line. So um, I did take my uh, joystick interface and try to like build a series of peripherals for people wanting to run motors and controllers and stuff like that. And of course I never knew how to market anything like that. Uh, so while I had one, yeah, I wasn't about to spend money on advertising. So I didn't know if it'd pan out or not. Sure. And I see an Apple II Plus behind you and uh, an old Mac. Do you still have your, your Atari? Yes, I do. Yeah. It's in a box with um, 
was that silica gel to keep the moisture out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it is um, enclosed in a coffin to just save it forever. You know, the funny thing was, is that when I put it in that box, I figured one day I would pull it out and give it to my daughter and say, this is what old computers used to be like. Because I figured nobody would have them anymore. And uh, then the internet showed up and eBay showed up and now everybody has these old computers. And I'm like, okay, well, it's still in the box, whatever. Is it an Atari 800? It's an Atari 800, right? Nice. Which, yeah. um, I should point out that I think Lefty only used one 16K memory module mm -hmm. and the basic cartridge. That's all it really took. Um... I actually, I tried load it when I loaded it this morning in my emulator, it, it did not work on a 16 K machine. Uh, I had to emulate a 48 K machine for it to load. Maybe, okay. but maybe originally it was smaller, but it might've grown to be a bigger program. No, I think it's, I think it's more likely that, um, 30 year old memories are just fallible. That's true. 40 year old memories are fallible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, you got a blurb in, in Enter Magazine, and you got a blurb in the, the, the uh, museum's, uh, ex the Omniplex Explorer magazine, and then you were written about in the, or there's a photo of the robot working in the, the Daily Oklahoma newspaper. Yeah, it, it kind of made a splash at that time, 1983. Robots, uh, robots were not that common. Um, you'd see them in like, the the automobile factory lines uh but you didn't see them really out and about uh, it was kind of a new different science fiction world of things so um it kind of was a big deal and so it, it showed up in a couple of different places different magazines um what i'm curious about is since this was at a museum there has to be a ton of home photos that people took on their cameras that are now in like their, their old box of, you know, developed 35 millimeter camera film. And there's got to be a ton of them, but I'll, I'll never see them. I mean, how would you find any of those? Right. How did you, this, this morning I sent you a couple of screenshots of your, your program running. Um, which I think is the first time you've seen it running in many, many years. How did that make you feel? Um, it, that was a serious trip down memory lane. Um, I was quite ecstatic to see it again. Um, for one thing, I want to run the original code in this guy. And so I had been scratching my head on, you know, what exactly do I need to do to get this old program back? Um, I knew I had the cassette for it. Um, I hadn't used that cassette or played it. I kept it in a nice, safe location for all these years. But I don't have Atari cassette player. And um, I really didn't know how I was going to get the program over. And then, of course, you know, I sent, sent the audio of that tape to you, and you're able to help me get that program out. So that's, that's, that's huge for me. Um, and I, I was noticing that, like, you know, I came up to the screen that says, press the black exec button. Right. And you probably know, as many Atari fans know, there is no black exec button on the Atari. So what we did was, anytime you build a museum piece, you have to assume that there's a group of kids there trying to destroy whatever it is you made. Right, this thing needs to be mil-spec hardened, right? <laughs> Against abuse. <laughs> and in the back room of the museum, there was some keyboard. I don't know what it was to or what it came from, but instead of being like um, a keyboard where there's like a plunger that goes down and pushes a switch or maybe uh, closes a contact or any of the number of different styles of keyboards, this one used a reed switch. And if you know anything about a reed switch, it's a little glass tube and it's got these two pieces of metal in it. And if you get a magnet close to them, those pieces of metal will close. You remove the magnet and they pop back open again. And so this had a circular magnet and it would push it down 
on that read switch and it would close. And of course it's, you know, there's just a, a finite movement and then the substrate. And we uh, built a, a bottom to it that was like, like an inch thick or so, uh, so that people could like just literally pound on this keyboard and it wouldn't harm it at all. And the electronics were, you know, safe. So we use this uh, we use this keyboard to make it what we call John Q public proof, and it did. It lasted the whole time without any hiccups at all. But that meant that the Atari had to read the keyboard through that joystick port. And so when you ran the program, it says plus press the black exact button. Well, what's going on right now is on your key or joystick ports, those bits are twiddling reading that keyboard and it's waiting for that key to be pressed. And without that keyboard, it's not going anywhere. So I could um, change the program in that one piece or one place uh, so that it would just use the normal keyboard and then that way the rest of the game will play because there's nothing else that is preventing it from uh, playing. Right. Just that one keyboard. Just need to, yeah change the keyboard read routine and hook it up to a robot and uh, it should work. It'll be fun to see it yeah. running again. Yeah, it will be. This doesn't use uh, stepper motors. So of course I don't need that assembly language routine. Uh, the fact that it's delivering uh, position information through that one routine is enough to then rewrite the routine for this robot and have it work is exactly the same. Of course, I'll have to make it so that you know visitors online uh, are able to interact with it too. Sure, neat. Or you could maybe feed it. I don't. I don't know if there. You know, if there's. Uh, you could. I know for chess people, you could download exciting games from history or something. I mean, maybe the the checkers people do that too, and you could like literally like download a uh, some world class players and then you could have it recreate a game perhaps that's an interesting idea um of course i've had some ideas like you know keep high scores so that people around the world can compete with each other um and i also had the idea of uh setting it up so that somebody could upload their own game logic and so they can oh, have like a, a different checkers game or even better yet, uh, set it up somehow where um, it doesn't have to be checkers. Mm -hmm. It just has to use the same pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they could, whatever I, they would want to upload. I love and the of idea course, of, I love yeah. the idea of you uploading your game logic and I upload my game logic and we just let our programs compete like a, in a core war sort of situation. That's a good idea. I haven't thought about the the game logic competing against each other like like an AI learning type scenario. I have not thought of that. Of course, that might take up a lot of the robot's time. And if this thing's out there worldwide, people are going to be wanting to play it. And I don't want to like tie it up, you know, competing against itself. I'd rather it compete right. against. People. And of course, then you'll that's, need a. That's still an interesting idea. <laughs> I like it. What do you do today? I'm a consultant, which uh, means that I get into all sorts of interesting projects. Um, I, I also have to include that uh, I'm a NASA contractor. Um, I wrote a program for NASA. Oh my gosh, has it been? It's been 20 years ago. I wound up with a job at NASA writing what was called flight hardware. And the idea behind flight hardware was that um, the government buys all this material for the space program. They flight certify everything, which is a very expensive process. And once it gets flight certified, then they have these components they can use. Well, Teledyne Brown and Boeing and everybody building satellites and shuttle components and everything, they have to flight certify all their stuff. And uh, they have leftovers. And so when the projects are done, they, what do you do with the leftovers? 
So it used to be the case that they would put them out at public auction and people would pick them up for pennies on the retail dollar. And so all that money of flight certification got wasted. And so there's a guy out there, his name's John Salisbury, and he came up with this idea of doing what he called Amazon.com for flight hardware. Now, at the time, all websites were just these static brochures. Here's our information. Come look at it. Here's our phone number, whatever. Uh, but nobody was really doing anything active. Uh, but Amazon.com jumps up and makes this online order system. And I don't know if they're the first ones to do it, but I know that they were amongst the first ones to do it. And so John wants to put all the flight hardware, which is very valuable, into a system and allow all the engineers across NASA agency-wide, worldwide, to be able to shop for nuts and bolts that are already flight certified. And um, I just, happened to be the lucky guy who got the job. And, but the first thing I had to do is figure out how do I write a website that's connected to a database so that I could build this shopping cart for flight hardware? Because if you go back to when this was made back in 1998, there wasn't anything. You know, you didn't have JavaScript. Um, you didn't have these these programs where you just drop the shopping cart in it was it was just html and so i had to figure out how do you get html to interact with this stuff and went out and got a lot of books on you know basically websites are part of a unix system figured it out uh and put it together so it was about 98 is more than 20 years ago now that i put the numbers there <laughs> Uh, but for quite some time now, they want enhancements to it. And they'll call me out and say, we, we need this enhancement or we need that enhancement. And um, so I've been a NASA contractor for about 20 years. What haven't I asked you about the Atari days that I should have? Oh, boy, I think we, uh, we covered everything that might be interesting to, to your listeners. Um, didn't really wind up being a big game player. I was mostly looking for, you know, how do I use this as a tool? Um, I wrote a, a, a basic to assembly converter at one point in time. I thought I was going to market that, but of course that went nowhere. <laughs> um, I do remember being on bulletin boards way back when. And, uh, you know, you've got the Commodore bulletin boards and you have the Apple bulletin boards and you have the Atari bulletin boards. And the people who had the Apples were just absolutely certain that their machines were so much better than these other play toys. And they would make up all these like really weird fictitious reasons why the Apple was better. And I would get in their bulletin boards and say, well, actually, they're all using the 6502. They can all dress 65K of memory. You know, there's some support peripherals in there. The Atari has all these coprocessors that the Apple and Commodore does not have, you know. And then I would come back the next day to see what kind of responses I would get from them, and I would be banned from the board. Like, no, no, that's, that's outside of what we want to believe. You don't want to be associating with those Apple people anyway. It's okay. It's, it's all for the best. Yeah, it's funny that the two I have up here are Apples. But um, they're, they're, they're just uh, acquisitions. Uh -huh. um, at some point in time, I had a big computer collection. And I've moved so many times that it just got cumbersome to move. So I kind of got rid of it. However, I do, I still have the first computer that I ever got. You recognize that? Is that a Kim one? It's in the same arena. This is a cosmic elf. Mm, okay. Yeah. Single board. Uh, yeah. Nice. It's so, beautiful. The, yeah, I put it in this nice little 
you know, museum quality cabinet and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I got this guy. I got this guy as a birthday present when I was 14. And uh, Popular Electronics had put out a how to build this kit. And so I was collecting the parts to do the kit that was presented in Popular Electronics. And my father, who had always been supportive, always been supportive of computers and electronics and stuff, um, suddenly started downplaying this. You can't build that. That's too complicated. You need all these expensive parts. And I would, I would argue with them, like, but dad, it's just you solder these pieces together and you like, you know, turn the power on and you write a program. What's so hard about that? You can't do that and stuff like this. And I'm confused on why he's like dissuading me from doing this. And then my birthday rolls around and this comes in a kit form. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> He had had this sitting in the closet for months while he's like going, trying to get me to not buy all the parts that <laughs> he had the closet already. <laughs> he already had bought for you. Oh, man. Yeah. But it, it did. It came as a kit. And I had to, you know, solder all the parts down and cross my fingers. I didn't put in something wrong and power it up. And there you go. Wow. All right. I think this is my last question. If you could send a message to the people who are still using their Atari computers today, and you can right now, what would you tell them? <laughs> oh, still using the Ataris. Wow. Um, hang on to it. Um, you know, these things are a piece of history that will not go away. So, I mean, I've, I've got mine, you know, save for posterity's sake i won't even like get it out and touch it but um they're they're kind of neat um my neighbor across the street wound up getting an atari 400 after i got mine and i don't know <laughs> all right fair enough thank you scott this is great all right well thanks for having me